Hi there and welcome. I am so glad you are with me today. Today we are going to tackle a question that has some controversy attached to it and that is do eye rides change? It's good to have you with me whether you're with me on the webinar or on Facebook or on our Instagram live stream. It's just great to have you here. While we are just um, giving people a half a second to get on because there may be more people trying to show up, I would love to know if you are familiar with constitutional iridology. If you are, drop me a comment. Let me know uh, if you're on the webinar, hit the chat box or the comment box. Let me know if you're familiar with constitutional iridology. Same if you are with me in Facebook or if you are with me on Instagram, I would love to know. And while you're doing that, uh, we also need to do this little disclaimer. This information is meant for your education only. It is not meant to diagnose or prescribe. You are responsible for any results, good or bad, you get from using this information. Done. Okay, so here we are. Again, I would love it if you would just take a moment and introduce yourself in whatever chat mode you're following me in. Let me know uh, your name, where you're from, and are you at all familiar with constitutional iridology? And I'd also like to know if you have a bit of a holistic practicing background. And if you do, what, what training do you have there? The reason I wanna know that is because I like to tweak my presentations on the fly. And you, if I know that I've got all practitioners here, then I'm gonna talk at a different level than if I know I've got more general public here. So let me know what is your background. What you're gonna find over this next 30 or 40 minutes that we're together is that, um, that the more you play with me, the more you actually comment and interact, the, the more you're gonna get out of me, right? That kind of just feeds me and away we go. Hi, Sade, it's good to see you on Instagram. Thanks for being with us. We are just getting ready to roll. I'm gonna flip my camera around for our Instagram friends. There we go. While you are letting me know what your background is in constitutional iridology and holistic health, I'd like to introduce myself. Just take a moment here. I started studying holistic health in 1979. And I've been working with clients since 1981. And among the credentials that I've earned in this last 40 or so years, I have become a, um, a master herbalist, a natural nutrition clinical practitioner, a certified iridologist, and a certified comprehensive iridology instructor. And we've got Delina, who is join, joining us on the webinar, says she's from Ontario. She's a registered holistic nutritionist. Yes, with a beginner knowledge of iridology. Delina, you are in the right place. And I hope I'm saying your name correctly. In addition to my professional credentials, I am also a wife of one. And we just celebrated our 40th anniversary, so we're pretty happy about that. The mom of seven and the grandma of eight. Um, again, if you would like to ask questions and things like that, I would love to know them and just chat them, put them into the chat box. And Enrique says, I'm learning from your YouTube channel right on. And that YouTube channel will give you a good foundation. So glad that you are with me. Thank you, Enrique. I appreciate that. So, you know, when I've been an iridologist for pretty much all of my 40 years in practice, and I had, I, I figured out how to actually use iridology to integrate everything else I know, which is really important because so often as holistic practitioners, when we learn a new tool, when we learn a new skill, it's often a standalone skill. And there's not usually any help teaching us how to implement it into what we do, how to bring it into our practice. And so it took me a few years. I've studied several styles of iridology. I settled on constitutional as being my go-to style. It's the one that really works well in my practice for me. It's the one that makes sense. It's the one that helps me get good results with my clients. But more than that, I've learned how to use it to draw on to help me pull in the nutrition and the herbology and the flower essences and the aromatherapy and the various different things that I do here in my clinic. And so 
and probably the, one of the biggest things when it does that is it helps me to actually create a deeper rapport with my clients way faster than I used to be able to. So let's look at iridology, we'll look at some eyes right now. We're going to look at how eyes change and talk about that process. Um, Again, iridology does help me to do my client assessments much more quickly. It also helps me to be more accurate. These are all really good benefits of iridology. It helps me to build faster and better rapport, which is so important, and it actually gets rid of the need for the intake form. I still use a release form. I think that's really important um, because you have to have that informed consent with your clients, but this really does help me to not need a three page intake form or you know a 20 page as some of my students have said they use. All right, you ready to look at some eyes? Here we go. So one of the things we want to be aware of as we look at eyes is that the change, the things that we see may not actually be accurate when we're looking at photos, okay? So these are the pictures of one of my clients, 40-year-old man, when we took these. These were taken with an eight megapixel digital camera. I want you to have a really, really good look at these photos because what I'm going to do next is show you what his eyes looked like when we took his photos, like not very long later, with a 24 megapixel digital camera. All right, so this is 18 months later, same man, different camera. What do you say? Have there been changes in his eyes? What differences do you see? What differences do you see? I'm going to show you those images side by side. What differences do you see? And I really want you to play with me in my sandbox here. I'd like to see some answers. What differences do you see? This is an important question. And it's important because we see lots of photos that seem to be before to after photos on posted on Facebook and um, and they appear hi Shabra it's good to see you on Instagram thanks for being there when we see these kinds of before and after pictures on Instagram Delina I love what you've said hazel to blue clouded to clear all right that and that is exactly what it looks like Delina oh my goodness that is so what it looks like what I'm going to say is that's what it looks like. That's not the reality of the situation, right? Look at the skin tones. Is it reasonable to think that a person's skin would go from that sort of orangey fleshy color to a super pink color? Not likely, not likely. And so what we've got here, the hazel to blue is because of a difference in the lighting in the camera. The image on the left of your screen was done with an incandescent ring flash. The image on the right was done with an LED built-in flash. Okay, so the LED shoots a little bluer, incandescent shoots a little more yellow, hence that's the color change. Clouded to clear, the image on the left is 8 megapixels, the image on the right is 24 megapixels. I will tell you, when I first saw this, when I took the second set of photos and I went, holy doodle, I was some relieved because the image on the left, some of those black areas, um, looks like what we called rarefaction as opposed to pigment. Now, rarefaction is significantly more concerning than pigment. And so I was delighted to see that it was actually black splatter pigment, which is still not a great indicator to have, but it's a whole lot better than having black areas of rarefaction. So in truth, as we look at it, his eyes didn't actually change at all. In spite of the great diet work we were doing and the fabulous herbs we were using, um, there was no change in his eyes at all. So, so important that when we're looking at before and afters that we understand 
uh, and I'm going to put before and after in air quotes here, that we understand that we've got this issue of tech, right? That we have to know what equipment was used, what lighting was used, and um, how this all played out. Because if we don't know that, we can't make a valid assessment. So having looked at that, and Delina, I'm so glad you weighed in on that one for me. Thank you so much. There's actually a better question that we can ask. And that better question is, what changes can we see in iRIDES and what do those changes mean? Now, we know that iRIDES do change. Hi, Nam fam, good to see you on Instagram. We do know that iRIDES do change, but they don't change the way I was originally taught in iridology. My first training in iridology said, put a client on a cleanse, use the right herbs, you're gonna see their eyes go from brown to blue or from murky to blue. And, um, and I did that for 10 years with clients and it didn't work. I would put people on cleanses, they'd be on special diets, they would be using special herbs and we would never see their eyes change at all. And that was very upsetting because I'd been taught I would see them change. And it meant that either iridology was a fraud or I was just really bad at this and I didn't want to be bad at this. I was getting results from my clients. Their eyes just weren't changing. So just as I was ready to walk away from iridology altogether, I learned about constitutional iridology. And that was all, made all the difference for me in the world. So let's look at what constitutional iridology says about this and how it works. All right, so one of the changes that we may see in an eye is that pigment may accumulate or be acquired, or it may become more dense. And I've seen many instances of this, but I've never seen pigment disperse. Now let's look at what this looks like. Here again, we have images of the same person's eye taken with two different cameras about 23 years apart all right and so this is actually my husband i know him very well and i know what i see in his eyes and i know what's happened over the years and so this the image on the left is actually a a scan of a print of a print the image on the right is taken with a 24 megapixel camera. So the image on the left had the incandescent flash, side lit flash, and the image on the right used the LED light, which means it was a little bit bluer. So a yellower light and a bluer light. That's part of what accounts for the color change. The other thing we need to remember is that in photographic prints, the quality of the paper makes a difference or the brand of paper makes a huge difference. The brand of film makes a difference. And even the developers can change, they can change settings on their machines that can change the color saturations. So can we take this as an absolute truth? No. Can we take this as an absolute truth? No, because we can set the white balance in a camera that has an LED or the, uh, sorry, in a digital camera. And so knowing that we can muck around with things like that, we're not going to use this for comparison of did we have cleansing or not. What I want you to really look at in here is very specifically this area from about 30 minutes to about 43 minutes, right in here. Can you see this patch of pigment that's in here? And I want you to look over here. Does that pigment exist here? Now, if you're thinking these really aren't the same eyes, let's do some, some assessments here. We've got a large mark here and the same mark here. Um, these cameras are both handheld, so I might not have held them perfectly level each time. So that accounts for why it looks like it shifted. It hasn't really shifted at all. It's just that I shifted the camera a little bit. We have this mark right here, which is sitting right here. We have this little patch of pigment right here, which is right here. Um, we've got this area here at about, what is that, about 24 minutes, and we've got it right here as well. And so when we look at these photos, they are the same person, again, taken 
20, probably, probably more like 30 years apart, maybe even more. But we can see that over time what has happened is this pigment has accumulated. And so what we know about pigment is it can accumulate, but it will not disperse. There's nothing we are going to be able to do with this gentleman's diet, with my husband's diet, with his supplements to make this disperse. I mean, he's accumulated that while we've been married. And I've been feeding the man well. And he's been taking supplements that I recommend, right? And this is still accumulating. And it's interesting to note some of the tendencies in his family for some health problems, right? And so we see pigment accumulate, but we do not see it disperse. So when we look at this now, what we understand is that this pigment color correlates to liver. And we know liver has an awful lot to do with skin. And in the last four or five years, he's developed a real problem with his skin being very itchy. And we are constantly working to try to figure out what is it we need to do to help his liver function better to take this itching out. All right, so that's one of the things that we're doing. We know he's not anemic. We know he doesn't have a thyroid problem. Um, and so we are very suspicious that this is probably a bit of a liver predisposition in him. But you can see that the pigment has accumulated from nothing in there many, many years ago to something in there. So we have pigment that accumulates. Again, are these pictures of the same person's eye? So what we are going to do is we're going to match them. In the image on the left of your screen, we have this fiber that starts at just at about 18 minutes and comes down to about 21 or 22 minutes. We have that very same fiber sitting right here. Notice how we also have a pupil that is slightly misshapen. It's a little bit flat here and a little bit flattened here. Same thing here and here. Notice how we've got this bit of a flare here where it's very bright right there. We've got it right here. We've got this fiber coming down here. We've got this fiber coming down here. So these are the same person. Now what I want you to do is look for these little dots of pigment. And what you are going to see as you compare the new image to the old image, these dots of pigment were not in the old image. Now these are images of one of our sons who is now in his mid thirties, which means that this picture would have been taken when he was probably about, and I should have a date on it, but I don't exactly, he would have been about four years old, right? So he didn't have those pigments in there at that point in time, but they did accumulate. And so what do these pigments actually mean? Well, again, they tell us the color of the pigment tells us which organ is is inherently programmed to be under stress and to be causing stress and the placement of the pigment is telling us which organ is bearing the brunt of that stress i always think of this like a five-year-old and a three-year-old where the five-year-old knows that if he pokes the three-year-old the three-year-old will scream and get in trouble so think of the pigment color as being the five-year-old so it's the organ that wants to cause a problem poking the three-year-old so that where the pigment is sitting is the three-year-old, and that pigment is gonna make whatever organ is in this reaction field scream for help, okay? And so when we look at these pigments again, um, these are not a buildup of toxins. You'll see a lot of people on Facebook saying that this is a buildup of toxins, the person used drugs that have accumulated in his body. This person needs a detox. That is not what this is at all. Not even a little bit. These are genetically programmed to pop up in the eye or to accumulate in the eye just the same way my hair was programmed to start going gray at about the age of 58, right? And so this is a genetic programming. These specific pigment colors suggest, again, that liver has some inherent predispositions. And again, the position of the pigment teaches us which organ is going to bear the brunt of that stress.
So in constitutional iridology, we are not going to absolutely address every single pigment location we see because every one of them might actually not be important. It's far more important to address the root of the problem. So rather than taking your, your constitutional iridology map and saying this pigment is sitting in organ reaction field, blah, these are sitting in the adrenals, this is sitting in the kidney, this is sitting in the liver, you know, and working our way around. Um, that's not useful. But to know that these are all coming, these are all because of the liver itself, it makes a whole lot more sense to give the bulk of the support to the liver, to help the liver do its job as well as we possibly can. So in this case, we look at diet, we look at lifestyle, we look at emotional habits because we know emotions have an impact on how our body works. And we know that our body is actually, uh, we have emotion coded into our DNA. So sometimes we've got some massive work to do to see if we can override how that's going to function. All right, so with this, um, this son actually brilliantly became a red seal chef now i don't know where you live but here in canada we have a program and what programs that are uh, government regulated where you do the training you pass the exam it gives you credentials that allow you to practice as a chef anywhere across canada and typically in any commonwealth nation and so he has achieved that which is pretty cool um, and he knows his food and he eats very holistically. He eats a lot of organic. He's always doing locally sourced and everything in their home, except for Friday night date night is homemade, which is very cool. So he's really working on things and doing things that will support his liver. But we do need to look at everything, diet, lifestyle, emotional habits. Um, then we need to look at what do we do with that? How do we modify the diet? How do we, uh, what herbs do we need to do? What kind of protocols do we need to work on here? So another change that can happen, it's not an iris change. This is in the cornea. So this is in the clear layer that is in front of the iris. So I should have grabbed my little eyeball. Just let me grab that. And who am I kidding that it's little? It's actually much bigger than life size. And so as you look at this, I'm gonna pop my camera around for our Instagram friends. This layer that's right here, so on Instagram you can see this quite clearly, there's this clear bubble. And can you see that? Yes, you can. This clear bubble in front of the iris. This is the cornea, right? This is, it's that clear protective layer um, that sits in the very front and it is very susceptible to change, but the change that it's susceptible to is the accumulation of stuff. So when we see this in an eye, we know this is in the cornea. We know that this um, suggests, we don't usually see this in younger people. Well, we're seeing it more and more in younger people. Um, but this suggests that the liver enzymes are out of whack and the liver's not properly handling carbohydrates. Some people, we used to call this a, a corneal, uh, sorry, we used to call this um, an indication of high cholesterol or sodium cholesterol ring. We don't call it that anymore. It is known now as a lipemic diathesis or corneal, in this case, corneal annulus because it goes all the way around. So when we see this, we rarely see it under people people in the, under the age of 20. We often see it in people over the age of 60. Now, if they're over 60 and is just starting to develop, we all, almost don't worry about it too much because it can be natural aging of the cornea. If we see it between the ages of 20 and 60, we really wanna be taking action with this because again, this suggests that the liver doesn't want to handle carbohydrates properly. And instead of breaking them down all the way, it's turning them into triglycerides and cholesterol, the bad kinds of cholesterols, particularly triglycerides though, that can really muck up the circulatory system. And so when we see this, um, we're not gonna dissolve it. There's nothing we can do to make this go away. Instead, we need to use this indicator to ask the questions so that we understand more clearly 
is this person's diet the problem? Is this person's liver the problem? Um, does, is this person, is there an emotional warp that is helping to feed this issue? And so when we understand all of that, we understand what to do with the client to help bring that liver back online and help the liver do its job properly. But there's, there's nothing we're going to do to actually dissolve this. Now, having said this, sometimes by the time a client gets to me, they've got one of these that's very advanced, but they've already figured it out. They already have been told that they've got elevated cholesterol, elevated triglycerides. They're already getting their diet cleared around. I don't necessarily need to nag them on that, but I can show them in their eye what the results of their previous poor diet is doing in their eye and correlate that to what likely was happening in the body. And we can work from there. Does that make sense? That just because we see it in the eye doesn't mean it's a current problem. It could be a problem that is long done and resolved and the client's doing the right things to resolve it so we don't need to deal with it. If on the other hand, we're speaking with the client and we're seeing this either, if it's this advanced, we're, we're really gonna work hard if they haven't started working on things yet. But if they're young and we see a little bit of this forming at the edge of the eye, we are really going to have that conversation about their diet, their lifestyle, their liver function, and what they can do to help their body um, work better. So we're always using this to help us understand where the client is now, what they are doing now, so that we know what to make, uh, what recommendations to make, whether it's diet or lifestyle, right? So we've got the eyes give us much information on which to ask questions. And that gives us a lot of information so that we understand where we need to go with this. Because our, our, our goal is not to look at the eye and work with just what we're seeing. It's to understand the client and their health and understand what the next best step would be for them to do. We will sometimes see the pupil change shape. Now, this is not a quick response. This is one that takes a lot of time to put into place. But the, the pupil itself reflects spinal alignment. That, that inner edge of the pupil has nerve feeds that go right back into the brain. Because, I mean, the whole eye does, but this part specifically does have a lot of nerve feeds that go back to the brain. And when we see that the pupil is not round, we know that there has been a long-standing spinal subluxation. And you know that if the spine is misaligned, it interrupts nerve feeds to various parts of the body that can alter organ function. And so when we see someone who's got pupils that are really not round. We need to be recommending to them that they get proper care for that. Now, whatever you're comfortable recommending, whatever your client is comfortable doing is great. Whether they want to do chiropractic or osteopathy or um, Dorn therapy or yoga or some kind of care for that spine, maybe massage with chiropractic or whatever. Um, we need to be recommending that to them because that pupil that's not round, again, suggests that there are nerve feeds that are being interrupted, that are being affected. And our goal is to help our client achieve maximum health, which means encouraging them to take care of all parts of their body. And over time, if they are diligent, over time, that pupil may become more round. It really depends on how long things have been out of alignment and how seriously, how badly they were out of alignment as to how long it's going to take to bring this back into full round. Now, um, most people aren't willing to do that much work, right? And so you may not see this change quickly or you might not see it change at all if they're not willing to do all the necessary work. Another area of the eye that changes is the sclera or the white of the eye. And again, these are my husband's eyes from a long time ago and from not too long ago, where we are looking now at the sclera. So we're looking at this area of the white of the eye. And what I want you to see here particularly 
is this blood vessel here. Look at how thick this one is. And look at how thin this little end of the Harry Potter scar is. Now, when we come more up, up to date, more currently, what we see is this blood vessel has gotten much thinner. It's not nearly as significant, but this Harry Potter scar one has gotten much thicker. So the, where the iris is inherent and genetic, and we can't do anything that will change what we see in the iris, that's just totally up to nature, up to the person's genetics. We will see in this, we may see in the sclera other things because the sclera is dynamic. Now you already know this, if you've ever had a good hard cry and seen how bloodshot your eyes get from that, and then how quickly that settles down again, right? The sclera is very dynamic. So when we see an area where the blood vessels are thick, it suggests to us that the adjacent area in the iris, we look at what are the organ reaction fields in here, has some kind of congestion happening in it. When this blood vessel then calms down, we know that that congestion has, has eased up. And so in this case, because these blood vessels overlap some, we've got this one, but then we've got this little one up here in the corner. We know that whatever's happening here has settled, but whatever's happening here, so right in this area, is persisting. Okay, so it gives us a clue as to what is happening dynamically in the body. Now, sometimes, Henri, yeah, he does have beautiful blue eyes, but I, I'm in love with him, and so I probably would think they were beautiful no matter what color they were. And so um, when we see these, it's important to remember that as we see blood vessels in the eye, if the client has no symptoms in that area, then what we're looking at is something that is preclinical and has is out of balance, but has not become so out of balance for the client to actually recognize it as such just yet. So what about ways iroids do not change? Well, when I first started studying iridology, I was taught that all of the lines inside an area like this, or like this were healing lines, that these lines had formed, that this shape said there was something drastically wrong right now, but the fact that there were lines inside it um, that had apparently built on their own suggested that this was starting to heal. Well, we now know that that is not true. We now know that the iris itself is made up of layers of these fibers. These fibers are called trabeculae. And that when we see an opening like this, that is an opening in the top layer, and we are simply looking at the next layer down of fiber that is already in the eye. It hasn't formed, it hasn't developed, it's not a sign of healing. They've always been there. And the way the trabeculae are organized, whether we've got lots of these petal shapes or whether we've got lots of areas that are kind of open like this and then filled in, or whether all of the trabeculae are nice and just they look like they've been combed like beautiful hair, it's all inherent. When we see, again, trabeculae inside a lacuna, we call this shape a lacuna, lacuna, it simply means again that the top layer of fiber has separations in it and we are looking at the next layer of fiber down. It does not mean these are not healing lines. They didn't magically appear as a result of diet or supplements. They've always been there. I was also taught that lacunae, when they got, could get smaller and that that meant that healing was happening. Now, again, this is not accurate and here is why. Uh, what we are looking at here is a lot of different changes in the eyes, in, in this eye. This is the same eye. Again, these two pictures on the left were taken within minutes of each other, and then the one on the right was taken a few years later. 
I want you to take a really good look at these. What is one significant difference you see from one image to the next here? <coughs> what do you see? And whether you're on Instagram or on the webinar, I'd love it if you would weigh on this. What is the difference you see from one image to the next? Any takers on that? As pupil size, yay, thank you A5 on Instagram. First image looks bigger pupil like trauma response. First image is huge, absolutely that first. Good job, everybody. This pupil is huge, which of course could be from um, a lighting color or uh, from how much light was shone into the eye. This might have been a dimmer light than what this is. That's distinctly possible. Could have been that these were taken many years before this one, and so that could be the issue. On Instagram, they're saying color change from gray to blue. That is a camera issue, not a cleansing issue. Okay, we've got an incandescent light here, and uh, we've got an LED light here, and just even the fact that the cameras were different means that we've got the difference in white balance from camera to camera, so that's not going to be um, a valid comparison either. But the pupil certainly is. I want you to consider for a minute that in the eye, we have all of these fibers or trabeculae. When the pupil is large, those trabeculae end up getting compressed into a shorter area. Now I want you to think about the front of your trousers or your blue jeans. When you sit down, what happens to the fabric right in the front of your thigh where your, your thigh connects to your body, you know, that area just in that bend? And uh, Enrique is being a smarty pants, midriasis, absolutely, good word, good word. So when, but when these fibers are compressed, they get wrinklier. I want you to think of this, these lacunae as being like balloons that you would make um, balloon animals with. You can blow up the balloon and you can squeeze it in one place and it's going to change the shape, but it still is holding the same volume of air, right? So we've got the same amount of space in here. So what we've got here is when this pupil gets big, these fibers compress, they get crunched into a smaller area. They don't telescope, but they wrinkle. And it means that this has to get wider. As the pupil gets smaller, the, the fibers get stretched out, and so it begins to make it look like the lacuna is shorter from top to bottom here. But notice that it is fatter. We have the same volume. When that pupil gets smaller, because this light is a really bright light, it, it brings the pupil down, that stretches these fibers out a little bit more, and again, it changes the shape and I put that in air quotes, changes the shape of the lacuna, but the lacuna still has the same volume. So the lacuna has not gotten smaller. Just by virtue of the way the fibers are, are um, affected by the pupil getting larger or smaller, it changes the apparent shape of the lacuna. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So with this, yes, Delina, thank you so much. Good job. So with all of this, we need to ask the question then, can we monitor, that, monitor health improvements through the eye rides, through the actual iris itself? And the answer is absolutely no, we cannot. We cannot monitor health improvements through the iris because the iris itself doesn't change in response to diet and supplements. We want to monitor our, use the eyes to help us understand where the client's weak links are, where their inherent weak links are. We want to use the eye rides to understand the interplay of the different organs, because that helps us to create more effective programs for our client. But we never want to rely on the iris to monitor change because it's not going to. Instead, we want to rely on our client's report of symptoms to monitor their change, or if they've had labs done, we can certainly do that as well. We can, however, use the sclerae 
to monitor improvements, right? If we see blood vessels becoming calmer, we know we're improving. So now that I've shared a little bit of iridology with you, I am hoping that it would be okay, oops, that's a blank slide, if I introduced, took about three or four minutes to introduce a course that is coming up called Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology Assessment System. We just updated the name. This is a course for herbalists, nutritionists, and naturopaths who want to streamline their, client, their clinical work without sacrificing their client care. Now, many of you who are with me today are practitioners. You're nutritionists or you have some kind of, of other training where you're working with clients. And oftentimes what I see is holistic practitioners see the client, gather lots of information, maybe give the client a starting point, maybe not. And then the practitioner goes off and donates two or three or four hours of their own time unpaid to create a client program then they bring it back to the client and the client may or may not keep that second appointment to get their program, right? So if you're charging for one hour or maybe two hours, if they actually come back for the second appointment, but you've actually spent six hours in total on them, what's that doing to your income? Hmm. What dynamic iridology does is it helps you to get your programs created in your client sessions. When you do it the way I teach it to you, you will stop donating time and you will be able to get your client's next step program created right when you're with them. And so what does this do? It helps you to stop working unpaid overtime. It helps you to stop overwhelming your clients because if it takes you two or three or four hours to create the program, it's probably more information than the client actually needs to get to the next step. And that can be very overwhelming. And when they're overwhelmed, they don't follow through. And when they don't follow through, they don't get results. And when they don't get results, they don't come back, right? So we need to create programs that are doable, that they can have success with, that will make them want to come back to find out what's the next thing I need to do. We also find because of this, and what I've just described is that it increases client compliance, increases client success, and it increases long-term client retention. I have many clients who've been with me for 30 to 38 years, and I am now on to third generation clients where at the beginning I saw the mom as she was having her babies, and now those babies are having babies, and so I've got three generations of the family coming in. If you would like to learn more about this, this course, if you want to stop working over, um, over time, if you want to stop creating programs that your clients find too complicated, if you want your clients to keep coming back because they're getting good results, then I am inviting you to join me for an info session on, on Wednesday, September 23rd. So that's just coming up um, at 5 p.m. Mountain daylight time here is the registration link for that session now again it's um this session is going to give you everything you need to know to decide whether the program is actually for you or not because the goal of the program is to teach you how to use constitutional iridology and how to use it confidently so that you can integrate what you already know, whether it's herbology or nutrition or um, body work or whatever you know, so you can integrate it confidently and create those manageable programs for your clients that are going to help them get better success. This is what one of my students said. Now she was a naturopath, is a naturopath in Australia. She had already done some iridology training as a part of her naturopathy and she said, Judith's course, Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology, surpassed my previous training in structure, content, delivery, and documentation. Iridology has certainly reduced the time required for prioritizing a treatment plan. I love that. And iridology, without a doubt, has been a huge game changer to my practice because this is about helping you to be more successful by helping your clients be more successful. That's exactly what it's about. In the course, we actually do practice a lot how to create programs as well using what you've learned. 
So again, I'm encouraging you and inviting you to join me for this webinar on the 23rd at 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The next course will be starting, full course will be starting on October 7th, and we'll be doing all the details in the webinar. Now, those of you who are with me on Instagram, if you would like the link for the Wednesday, the 23rd info session, please PM me or DM me, whichever you wanna call it, your email address, and I will make sure that you receive that um, by DM or by email. In addition, during this webinar, I'm actually going to give you, we're not going to talk just iridology, but I'm going to give you three specific things that you can start doing right now to help you reduce the amount of time you're spending creating client programs and to help you actually increase your client retention right away. Right, so I'm going to give you some tips right away that I figured out over the last 40 years, actually about 30 years, because I've been doing them for many years, that will be very helpful to you. So I'm inviting you to join me for this webinar to learn how iridology can benefit you and your clients as, and help you be more effective, more efficient, take whatever fabulous results you're getting and up, up scale that by at least a notch or two. We're gonna talk about how the program's delivered, what the dates for the program are, what the tuition is, how to get registered, everything that you could possibly need to know to make that decision. So that is all the information I have for you today. I'm just wondering if there are any final questions before we wrap up. And I'll give you just a moment. We've had people from all the, all the way from, and this is not saying anything negative about anybody's training or, or anything like that, but we've had um, everyone from herbalists who were just starting out a nutritionist who were still in school but just about finished, uh, naturopaths who've achieved that, we've got everything in between. And so as long as you've got a little bit of a professional background, if you've got your anatomy and physiology, that's the basis that I, I want my students to have when they come into this course because we talk a lot about organs, organ systems, how they interrelate, and it's an important thing. So Enrique says, thank you so much for teaching us 10 out of 10. You're welcome, Enrique. I hope to see you in the course someday soon. And with that, I think we will call it good for today. Thank you so much for being with me. I have truly enjoyed being with you today and I hope you have a wonderful day. Hope to see you Wednesday at the webinar. Thanks, bye for now.